Um, gun control, gun ownership, my experience with guns. I'm not going to repeat uh, many of the brilliant points that other people have successfully made in their videos. In particular, I want to recommend Lengthy and Arthur's um, multiple, numerous videos on gun control. I have myself been tremendously educated by them. Uh, he has very clear reasoning. He knows a lot of facts. Uh, if you want to argue with gun control people, which I don't necessarily want to do myself, uh, but if you, if you are inclined to do that, you can glean lots and lots of very useful argumentation from like the Narcissus videos. Now, what I want to talk about today is, I want to give you a couple of anecdotes um, uh, that illustrate my particular attitudes towards gun control. I want to uh, point out the central inconsistency and the central danger uh, in the arguments that uh, gun control advocates uh, usually put forth. I want to talk about my own personal experience with firearms, uh, living in the state of New Jersey, and there was another thing that somebody asked me to uh, talk about. Oh, Lengthy and Arthur actually was the one who did. Um, uh, asked me to talk about, namely, how do people react, uh, how do people in Russia, my friends and family, let's say, react when I tell them that I'm actually a gun owner? And what do they think about firearms? So, first of all, again, I, I'm not a big fan of arguing with gun control people, even though it's probably inevitable and may even be useful sometimes, but I think most of those people will never be convinced, or rather are not likely to be convinced in any foreseeable future, because the views that they hold, they don't hold them because they've come to those conclusions uh, based on serious, thoughtful reasoning and research and honest deliberation. I think most of those views are, or rather most of those people hold their anti-gun views based on pure emotion, unexamined, their, their assumptions about things are unexamined, their, uh, their position is inconsistent, but they're not bothered by it because a consistency is not, is not a, criteria, uh, a criterion for them that's important. They don't attach too much value to consistency. Um, and I find it sort of similar to the general fear that I think uh, people experience when they start imagining the world without some of the things that they've come to think about as protections against life and life's dangers in general. The state has very successfully uh, advertised itself and promoted itself as the protector against chaos and evil, even though it is the source of much, if not most, of chaos and evil in today's societies. People have come to believe that the state is either some kind of guarantee, if not imperfect, if not perfect guarantee, but at least an imperfect guarantee against uh, difficulties, hardships, dangers, evils of all sorts. Um, and the this myth of police pr police protection, um, that the police are there to serve and protect you, is one of those falsehoods that people very readily believe, and I, I think. Uh, that is a testament to the tremendously successful PR that the state has had uh, in human societies, at least in the last hundred years or so, uh, you know, increasingly so. Um, so it's the fear when you start imagining the world without the state, well, but who will take care of me if I get sick? And I remember experiencing that fear. Uh, sort of early in my gradual process of conversion, to anarcho-capitalism or free market anarchism, which is a position I hold today, um, I remember reading on the healthcare uh, issue, and I, I remember um, reading a very long comment thread after a certain article that I read on the internet. And I forget what the article was about, but I remember what I was thinking and what it, what I realized, and I remember the feeling of fear that I felt, uh, very very strong fear, when I realized that yes. Yeah, I'm sort of for freedom, and I don't think that people should be guaranteed other people's money. But what happens if I get cancer, and I don't have insurance at that time or whatever, and I don't have the funds to take care of me, or let's say one of my children gets cancer or something? And I remember being horrified at the thought. And then I realized, yes, life is scary. Things can happen. Shit can happen that's very unpleasant, maybe deadly, very, very bad. 
But that fear passed real quick because I realized, yes, well, I may find myself in a situation where I'm not capable of taking care of myself or even my child. That would be horrifying. That would truly be horrifying. But I cannot bring myself to, to believe, to assert that, yes, if something like that happens, I have the right to other people's stuff. They should hand over their money to me and take care of me. They should be forced to take care of me. I realize that I don't believe they should be forced to take care of me. And I've accepted that fearful, unprotected condition that is the reality for us. We are not guaranteed against hardship. We're not guaranteed that nothing bad or nothing horrible will ever happen to us or the people that we love. And I realize, yes, you know, in that particular situation, if, I'm, if I have cancer and I don't have the money to get treatment, I will beg if I need to. I will beg for help. But I will not demand that people with guns go to the people who have the money to help me and grab that money from them and give, give it to me. And it's, according to, to Robert Higgs, who's one of my favorite writers currently and will probably stay for a long time, one of my favorite writers, fear is central to the success of the statist ideology. People fear things, and therefore, in that you know, uh, uh, under the influence of that fear, they give up their freedoms, they give up their rights to a group of thugs that, that says, we will protect you, just hand over your guns, hand over your freedom, do what we tell you, and you're going to be okay. And if you don't, you're on your own. Or if you don't, we will hurt you. Or if we don't, somebody else will hurt you and we will not protect you. And that fear will bring people, every time, will bring people to um, to hand over their liberties to the gang of thieves that calls itself the state. And the gun control, lots of gun control debates and lots of gun control opinions, I think, um, emanate from that same place of fear. And, and Robert Higgs says, look, fear, we need fear. Fear is an evolutionary mechanism. Fear is the feeling that tells us that something is dangerous. So to... to, to to, to, to tell people that they shouldn't fear is to give them advice they cannot take, and that's true. And it's a very rare person that will overcome their fear um, and still insist that, yes, life is dangerous, the world is dangerous, but people should not enslave other people, even though life is horrible like that. Now, I mean, I'm not going to go into like how guns, the, the mere presence of guns, does not cause crime in society. Although it's it's pretty interesting, you know, uh, if you, I, I bet if somebody did that exercise, if if you guys know of anybody who's done it, if you know where to get that data, send me a link. Uh, I'll be very glad to get educated on that. But if you superimpose a map of gun ownership uh, over the, uh, the map of crime, I'm pretty sure that we would see almost no overlap, or very little overlap. And the places with high crime tend to be places of where gun ownership is not very high, and vice versa places with lots of, in the United States, I mean, counties and cities and towns with very high percentage of gun ownership uh, will tend to be places where the crime is the lowest. And also in the last 10 or so years, roughly 100 million new firearms have passed into the private hands through legitimate sales. And that's only the, the, the amount that we know of. And yet that resulted in no increase in crime. Crime has actually been decreasing uh, slowly but steadily. So that should tell us enough about how crime, how crime is not caused by the presence of guns. Uh, but I'm not, I don't want to go into that. All of those arguments have been brilliantly made by, the, by, uh, by other people. Uh, I want to center on this, the thing that, or focus on the thing that I think is central to the irrationality of, law, of, of most gun control advocates, and that is the belief that, no, 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 the police will protect you. Well, I'll put it that way. That's the belief that the police will protect you. Mind you, people do not, people who say guns are evil generally do not advocate that the police be disarmed or the, arm, the army be disarmed. They do understand that yes, there will be crime, and I don't deny that, yes, there will be crime. And they want the police to have guns because they want the police to be able to stop the bad guys. Um, so they're at least inconsistent in that regard, but they say, no, 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 it's, it's fine. It's fine to have a dedicated group of people who have the authority to have guns and use guns, and they will use guns to protect us. They are the good guys. They will protect us from the bad guys, and that's the way to set up society. Yes, there will be a minority of people who are criminals who are willing to go and, and, and rape and, and pillage and 
uh, rob and kill people. And we, we should have a dedicated small group of our population called the police that have special authority and special rights. And among other things, they should be allowed, they should be the ones to be allowed to have firearms, and they will use those firearms to protect us from that, you know, other minority, the bad guys. Well, that, that is so unempirical and ahistorical and full of bullshit that I think it deserves some attention. First of all, the police do not pre prevent crime for the most part. We understand that, right? The police do not prevent crime. The police are crime historians. The police show up after, in 99% of the cases of violent crime, the police show up after the crime has been committed. Now, I don't deny that the police have, you know, uh, the presence of the police and the court system and the law and so forth is a deterrent. Oh yeah, it is a deterrent and it stops some people from committing crimes. If they thought they could get away with, you know, committing a crime more easily, they would do it more often, sure. Or more people will do it, sure. I, I agree with that. But why is it a deterrent? Why, why do criminals fear police? I think the criminals fear police. I mean, it's, I, I, at least it's, it's fair to imagine that the criminals fear the police because the police can catch them, stop them, bring them to a jail, and then have them go through a trial and be sentenced. And then the guards will take them to the prison and keep them in prison. Well, why are criminals so afraid that the police might be able to pull that off? Well, because the police have guns. If the police having guns is a deterrent, why wouldn't the population having guns, in a broad general sense, the population having guns, not be a deterrent? Of course it is a deterrent. I would argue that that's probably why higher gun ownership in a particular area will result in, in lower crime, crime rates. In things like home invasions and that kind of crime, it's particularly evident uh, I th I don't remember where I got that from, and you know, don't don't hold me to this. But home invasions in the UK after the gun ban have gone up because now, and we mean hot burglaries where um, the burglar gets into the house where there's somebody in the house at the time. Now those are particularly risky because um, now if they just burglarize your house when you're not there, well, or, well, you lose the property. But if the, if you confront the assailant or rather the burglar in your house they might do something crazy and they might attack you harm you or even kill you now if a burglar if if a burglar thinks that there might be a weapon in the house they will think twice before getting into that house if they know there isn't a weapon in there they don't particularly care whether you're, you're in there or not especially if they're big and strong and they have a knife which or a firearm which you know many of them will have and most of them have some kind of weapon these knives, uh, and then what are you going to do? Especially if, again, if they're big and strong. Guns are great equalizers in that a, you know a, a weak, small person can be just as effective with a firearm as a very big, very strong person. So it doesn't really matter what size you you are, or you know how fit you are, or how strong you are. With a firearm, you, you equalize the chances much much more. Um, so yeah, it's all these things are obvious. I, I think so. If the police are determined, then if, even if we grant that the police, this this minority called the police, uh, are uniformly good and they are in fact all they want to do is protect you and serve you, and stop the bad guys from harming you. First of all, they can't be there when the the bad guys are doing their bad stuff to you, because there can't ever be enough police officers. Enough, enough policemen with weapons everywhere to protect everybody and to, to, to prevent every crime. Even most crime. Most crime will not be prevented by the police. The cost of having enough police officers to prevent much crime is going to be so high that, you know, I, I don't think anybody would agree to it. Like, every other person would have to be a police officer. You know, one uh, out of every three able-bodied people will need to be a police officer. That's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. That's that's too expensive. That that means the you know two two thirds need to work to support one third, because while they're policing, they can't produce anything that is valued on the market, and therefore, uh, you know, I don't think we would. I you know imagine paying one third of your income for law and order. That would be a high kind of cost, wouldn't it? I mean, a price of a handgun is five, six, seven, 
hundred dollars. A price of a police officer would be one third of your income. Nah, uh, I think I'll carry a gun because the policeman is too heavy, uh, or you know, or so the joke goes. Anyway, but that's granting that the police are actually there to protect you. My central argument is that the police are not there to protect you. First of all, they can't protect you, even if they wanted to. Second of all, they don't want to. They don't necessarily want to. The people join the police force for all sorts of reasons, and I'm sure that some of them or many of them join, at least initially, because they want to do good things, they want to help society, whatever. But think of the incentives that, that govern uh, behavior of people who join that kind of group. You are, in a state like New Jersey, you, you're a police officer. The chances that you're the only one in any crowd carrying a gun are 99.999% because New Jersey does not allow concealed carry or open carry. It's virtually impossible to get, well, it is practically impossible to get a concealed carry permit in the state of New Jersey. You have to prove to them that you need one. So you have to prove to them that your life is in danger or something. And even then, the standards for that proof, I'm not sure what, what the standards are or whether there are any precedents of people winning against the state trying to get a concealed carry permit. I don't know. But it's I think it's ridiculous on, on its face to have to prove that you you know you actually need to defend yourself. It's ridiculous, it's absurd, it's evil. But anyway, that's the way things are in the state of New Jersey. So the think about the incentives again that govern the behavior of people in that group, the police. And I'll, gi I'll give you a personal anecdote, a story that I heard just a few days ago, uh, you know, sitting around a dinner table at a friend's house. Um, but my main thing is this. Even if the police could protect you, they will not want to. First of all, the police have a lot of power over you as individual citizens. And it's not that the power corrupts, although that is also true. I believe that's, that to be true. But like, I think it was Orwell who said, it's that it's a magnet to the corruptible. Think about the kind of person who will, who's likely to be drawn to the idea of being one of an elite group that is allowed to use violence to harass people, to pull them over, to write them tickets, to arrest them, and to have guns, to have overwhelming disparity of force over the rest of the population. Do you think that kind of group is more likely to attract sociopathic personalities than others? I think yes. And the facts support this. Here's a story. I'm, I'm at a friend's house. Uh, there are some other friends of his around. We're having dinner, drinking wine. And this girl, this, this woman, starts telling a story. Uh, she's Russian. Um, and she's telling us a story about a friend who's also Russian. And she runs, apparently... In another town in New Jersey, she runs a, 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 a preschool. So she runs a small preschool. She has a group of kids, you know, clients, parents of kids who bring their kids to her you know, to leave for the day or whatever. And this one time, this one little boy, um, apparently the boy had some kind of a, like a tin box with him when he came to the preschool in the morning in which he kept some clippings from like magazines and some, you know, clipped picture of Superman or Batman from some magazine. So he kept that picture in that tin box, and that picture was important to him. He, he played with it. it. It meant something to him. Apparently, he comes home, and his father realizes that the box is not there. The box had been left at the preschool. So it's, it's, it's after 9 p.m. This lady who runs the preschool is in her house, and she gets a phone call from this boy's father. Now, this boy's father is a police officer in the town. And the boy's father starts harassing her, basically telling her, look, you better get that box. My boy can't go to sleep. He's crying. He's missing his Batman picture. I want that box now. She says, well, it's 9.30 at night, sir. He says, I don't give a fuck what time it is. I strongly suggest that you get your shit together and go over there and start looking for that box. And when you find it, you drive to my house and you bring it to me. The girl, the, the woman is speechless. She is confused, she is embarrassed, she is, she is frightened because the man is getting aggressive on the phone. And I forget whether it was the same conversation. Well, no, no, the, you know, that was one conversation. So she actually, she was frightened enough to go back 
He says, because you don't want, you don't want to know what I can do to you if that box is not here in like half an hour or something. You don't want to know. You don't want to find out what I can do to you. I'm a cop, he says. He explicitly says, I'm a cop. He explicitly threatened to use his status as a cop to make her life miserable if she doesn't bring this tin box back to his house at 9.30 at night, if she doesn't get over there in person herself to bring that box back. That tells us something about the boy and the father, doesn't it? But anyway, the story continues. She drives over there and she realizes that she can't find the box. She can't find it. It's not there. So at like 10 o'clock, she calls the, the father back or he calls her back. And she says, sir, I can't find it. He said, and he, then he starts cussing her out and shouting at her. And this time, either this time or both times, he was actually calling or was it the next morning or something? Anyway, the next conversation is happening when he's calling from the precinct because she sees the number. It's the number of a precinct. That, that probably means that he called her. Um, and, and he starts shouting profanities at her and calling her a fucking bitch. And she can hear there are other police officers around the phone. She can hear it. There are other people having conversations. And he's calling from a precinct, so he's likely to be surrounded by his fellow police officers. And he's shouting at her and saying, I'm going to make your life hell. I'm going to shut you the fuck down. You're never going to roll through any... You, you're never going to cross any, any intersection in this town without a ticket forever for the rest of your life. I'm shutting you the fuck down, you fucking bitch. You, you better get that box back to me or I'm, fucking destroy, I'm going to fucking destroy you. I'm a cop. I'm listening to the story. I'm not surprised. The other people around the, around the table are so surprised. I'm thinking, like, why? Why would you be surprised at this? Like, what's illogical about this behavior? But anyway, so this thing continues. Then they have closed circuit cameras in the pre preschool. So she goes back and she starts looking at the footage and she realizes that one of the mothers, uh, or the mother of one of the children, other children, incidentally picked it up and put it in her bag and took it with her. So frightened out of her mind, she calls that other mom on the phone and asks her to please look for that box because, I, you know, ma'am, I really need this box. There's been a, a, a mistake. You know, you, you accidentally picked up this other thing that belonged to this other kid. Could you please look for it? And the mother's like, yeah, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not doing it. What are you, crazy? Do you know what time it is? That kind of thing. So she's scared out of her mind. She doesn't know what's going to happen to her in the morning, though, or, or rather the next day. When the mother comes back to pick up the child, she talks to the mother and asks her to please get the box back. Uh, but she's not legally, I think there's some kind of legal requirement that she can't tell the cop that um, uh, she can't reveal the, uh, the CCTV footage to the cop or something, whatever, or, or she can't reveal what she saw on the footage to the cop. So she's not telling him. He's, uh, he's actually pressuring her to give him the information because he wants to go after that woman to get the box. Apparently the box is very important. It's a four-year-old kid, a five-year-old kid, and god damn. Anyway, I have kids. I, no comment. Anyway, so what happens is the kid, the cop's son, overhears the conversation, and he realizes that she's the one who took his box. He flips out his cell phone, calls his dad, and tells him the name of the person who took his box. Oh, and the person's on welfare. And he calls... He calls, the cop, cop calls the preschool owner, starts shouting at her again and says, I want this fucking bitch kicked out of preschool. I want you, the f you, you bitch, you kick out that other bitch or I'm going to shut you down. And the woman was so frightened that she was actually contemplating asking that other person to leave, you know, firing that customer. She realized she can't because she's the, 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 the other mother. She's on, she's on welfare. She's, <laughs> she's some kind of protected minority or... She may not be an ethnic minority, but she was on welfare, so she realized she's stuck. She's fucking stuck. It's a catch-22. And then the, this, this episode happens with the kid over here in the conversation calling his father. And then the father calls back the preschool owner, and he's calm as water, and he's like, hey, I, I owe you one. She's like, well, what do you mean? He's like, oh, I owe you one. We, we don't know where the box is, so hey, we're cool. We're good. And anyway, thank you. And I'm going to get that other bitch, so don't worry, you're good, you're good. And hey, if you ever need anything, ever need help, you know, in this town, hey, I'm the, I'm the police, I can help you. We're best friends now, which is a typical behavior of a tyrant. They want you to like them. 
They want you to. I've gone through these things myself, and I can tell you a different story. Uh, you know, at a, at, a, at a different time. It's not for this video, but I can tell you, it's my personal experience that yes, they tend to act like that. The people in the position of overwhelming power over you, they toy with you, they threaten you. The next next moment, they're your best friend, and they think you should be grateful. And you kind of tend to feel grateful. Who they didn't kill me, or who they didn't rape me, or who they didn't arrest me for nothing. They must be good. So you want to, you sort of. Your impulse is sort of to feel good towards them or something. It's, it's weird and evil. But anyway, it's a story for a different time. That's your situation with the serve and protect crowd. That's your situation with the police. And that happened in, an afflu in a relatively affluent town in New Jersey. It's not like it's a ghetto or, you know, uh, inner city kind of situation. No, no, not at all. Not at all. So that's your friendly police officer right there. Any one of them could be that. Many of them are that. You will never know until you do, and then it's kind of too late because you're at their mercy. You are at their mercy. They don't give a shit about you. They didn't join the police force to protect you. They joined the police force to get off on the feeling of power over citizens and to collect their pensions. So don't be stupid. Don't be stupid. Even if they could protect you, which they can't, they can't, they don't want you. They don't want to most of the time. And they don't have to. That's another thing you have to realize. You might think, that, oh, I'm living in a democratic society and we have the police and it's the price, you know, the taxes are the price of civilization or whatever and part of the civilization is law and order and we pay taxes to get law and order. And no, 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 no. You're, you're fucking stupid if you believe that. The U.S. Supreme Court has ruled that you, as an individual, you personally, you, because you don't care about the larger society. There is no larger society. There's only you and other individuals who interact sometimes and sometimes not. But you, personally, you, have no claim on the protection services by the police. Let me repeat that. As an individual, you have no claim, no legal claim, on the protective services of the police. What it means is, if they fail to protect you, even if they are in a position to do so, if they fail to protect you or decline to protect you, you have no recourse. You can't do anything. You can't force them to protect you. You are literally at their mercy. You're at their mercy because many of them are sociopaths who get off on having power over other people. And you're at their mercy because they don't have to help you. If you're in your house and you suffer a home invasion and you're running around your house being chased by a lunatic with a, with a hatchet or with an axe and you happen to grab your phone and as you're running away, you know, running around your house from this assailant, you happen to dial, you know, you 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 succeed at dialing 911, and then you talk to the dispatch, and let's say it's going to take some time for the dispatch to understand what's going on, to dis to to send the patrol car or whatever, or several, and then they get to your house, and they're outside your house, they don't have to come in. You understand? They don't have to come in. And if you're a cop, think about it. You want to get back to your wife and kids tonight. You don't want to get shot. Or stabbed to death, or you know, uh, cut up. You don't. You really don't. Why would you want to get in there? Like, yeah, some people are, you know, heroes like that, and they will, because they genuinely want to protect somebody. True. But please understand this about the police. A lot of these people are bad people. That's why they're in the police. They most of the time will not get to you in time because it can't physically impossible, and they don't have to. They can stay outside and wait for the person to 